Hey guys, welcome back to Pillbox Movies. I'm Hank, and today we're going to be watching the 1971 Japanese samurai movie, revenge movie, Demons. This is a film by director Toshio Matsumoto. Matsumoto has been previously featured on this channel with 1969's Funeral Parade of Roses. The movie also stars Katsuo Nakamura. You might recognize Nakamura from another uh movie featured on this channel kaidan in which he plays hoichi the earless <sighs> demons is a lot uh as a warning this movie is horrifying and buckle yourselves in because this movie is gonna go some pretty dark places so yeah let's watch demons and before we get started don't forget to click the like button and subscribe for more old obscure and art house films also, a fair warning, my recording software cuts off numerous times over the course of this movie, but regardless, I really wanted to get this video out, so expect some hiccups along the way, and literal hiccups right now, but yeah, um, apologies in advance. I love starting with the uh, a color scene in a black and white film, kind of the assuredness, the avant-garde assuredness of Matsumoto working well into the 70s but still working with black and white as his chosen palette. It's almost like drifting back into a previous world, a previous um, feeling or atmosphere. The sun sets and color fades from the world. <laughs> it's a cool style for Mats Matsumoto. Also used a little bit in Funeral Parade of Roses. Um, the the editing style he uses to kind of reinforce the same like shot or the same like moment and kind of reinforce the sensation of it. Something that like Spike Lee uses as well. God, the use of zooms and the use of negative space. The use of negative space is amazing. doesn't shy away from the violence all that negative space is so brilliantly used <clears throat> god it's just brutal this unfurling of violence And this is a, this is another uh, wow the whites are so beautiful and this they're so translucent whatever film stock that Matsumoto is using is just Fuji film but uh another kind of motif or fixed image in Funeral Parade of Roses as well is the image of the laughing woman being something that's like anxiety inducing or threatening. You can actually hear the sound of the um, the the film like rotating. So I, I wonder if they're just capturing the equipment, the sound of the equipment, or if that's like an intentional artificiality that's been put into the movie to help like kind of like divorce you from the story. I don't know if that's because that's something that the Shinoda also utilizes in um, uh, Double Suicide. He kind of highlights the kabuki aspects of that story and that rendition to kind of like distance and to extract the story from its own kind of like own realism and uh funeral parade of roses also begins with a love making scene god i love this overhead shot Oh, 
したことで何せ朝な言うなに借金取りが押し寄せてな<笑><笑>こりゃ気が狂ったミリスネじゃんさあさあそんなたわけたこと言わんのさっさと帰らっしゃ覚えていらっしゃいませさあさあ女様そりゃ本心でござりますか The use of those blacks at the moment when you can't decipher what he's thinking. Beautiful, beautiful shadow play. It's really funny. It's really cool to see the ways that、uh, Matsumoto kind of reframes his shots. It's like very subtle, but it's kind of disorienting. The way that he, like, kind of he, he did that, he did that、um, pan, and it was like the two of them engaged in conversation. And then when we cut back to Matsumoto, and instead of it being like another close up, which would be more traditional in the format of an,、uh, editing a two person scene, it's further away, and he's more, he's even at a, kind of like an otter angle to make him seem more distant and less approachable. <laughs> Oldest trick in the book, the George Cassandra. Completely enveloped in darkness. I mean, it's good cost、um, cutting measure, but it really is so atmospheric. Yeah, she was too shy, obviously. Oichi, don't get involved in things that aren't your affairs. You learned this lesson seven years ago. <sighs> That moment in a movie when you know a character is going to irrevocably fuck up. There it is. So, like, I'm, I'm really struck by the way he's kind of composing this film and、um, blocking this film comparatively to Funeral, Funeral Parade of Roses to the degree that it feels like it's,、uh, in some ways, like a completely different filmmaker. Something that's like ever present in Funeral Parade of Roses. If you watch it, you're immediately struck by kind of like how engaged the camera is with the characters. Like it's all up in their grill. It's usually a lot of handheld stuff. And you're right inside of the life of, of Eddie、um, and her life and her livelihood and her perspective. Like the, the opening scene of the movie is her engaging in very, very close up intimate sex. And Um, the camera kind of like flowing over their bodies and taking it all in, drinking in the androgyny of, or even femininity of Eddie's body. And it's, it's like something that's like so divorced from the structure, the way that this is filmed, where I, I remarked on it when we had the overhead shot of Gengobi and, and、uh, Koman. Making love that we start out engaging in that, and then it's completely. 
completely divorce. It pulls away from that. And I wonder if this is a structure that this movie is going to break as it goes along, or this this is going to be kind of like the austerity of the movie that uh, Matsumoto, although capable of this kind of more uh, ground level, more like new wavy or Japanese new wave style will exercise a kind of denial in representing the emotional distance or the emotional uh, coldness of this era of this, of these people that he's representing. And, and with the shadows, I love the kind of like, it, it's like puppetry. We get to see like the person, the individual and the act, like a, a character or a silhouette of them performing, um, performing the gestures, performing the theater, the spectacle of it. Oh, they're going to fuck him so hard. I love this aspect of performance as well. Uh, if this is meant to be an ambush, that they're performing this refusal, it always kind of reinforces this idea of theater, of kabuki, of, the, of this story that's being told over and over again. These ancient stories, these ancient impulses something that's so well known so deeply written into our dna but revived in you every single night oh, such a clear manipulation i love this performance that she's putting on like she's in a theater the samurai's pride will always outpace his wits. So intensely, intensely dumb. Oh no. For never was there a tale of woe such as that such as that of Gengo Bay and his hoe. Oh god, it was another fantasy sequence. Oh, that's crazy. It's it was extended so far out. Oh, I actually really love this. This is also reinforcing another idea of performance. Uh, I love that they're going to repeat this. It's it's a, it's a weird kind of like structure to this this movie that things are getting um, redone over and over again. And I think that ties back into something I was saying previously about it being kabuki, about being um, like an endless cycle. But this this is this this part. It's like the I don't know. It's the revenge of the nerds aspect of it, I guess, that Gengo Bay has a projection of himself, this uh, performance of what he would act like in the platonic version of this, these events. And you, he has to like come crashing down and try and reinstigate that performance in the real world. And you'll kind of see the divide between him, the real him and his projection. But it's kind of, it's, it's, it's funny seeing all this, all of these projections at play, all this shadow play going on that, he has to put on a facade of what his persona is while being duped by these people who are also putting on a persona that will uh, feed into his ego, feed into his facade. So even if he acts like a complete fool in this scenario, even if he doesn't display the courage, the masculinity that he has in his head, uh, they, they will... Uh, affirm that narrative for him in fact he would almost be more of a fool if he came in and acted that in that dominant masculine style that he idealizes himself as it's 
it's very it's 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 very funny in a scammy kind of way it's very funny in like an andrew tate manosphere kind of way how much all of this play acting all of this shadow play is meant to feed into his ego so that he'll be parted with his money everybody is putting on a bad performance everybody's watching a bad performance and nobody can acknowledge that it is bad or that it is performance uh, in order to give everybody what they want <laughs> Oh, wow, he's breaking the projection. No, this is just another fantasy of his. This is what he believe, believes he is possible for him to do. But he can't, he can't resist the delusion, the man that he's, he perceives himself to be. And again, I, I love the distance of this, this perceived performance. He's watching another version of, of himself act out this, these, this uh, series of events. I, I can't believe this is the real world. This has to be, yeah, this has to be another fantasy. Oh, that was also a good um, callback to the earlier conversation that they had uh, where she had nearly uh, pricked herself with the hairpin. No, you fool. God, 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 He really is a full on fool. As are we all. If she didn't pay for her herself. What? Dude, it was just a little detail. I kind of forgot it in the moment. Wow. <laughs> He's going to commit the murders that was in his dream. I wasn't really expecting that to happen. Yeah, she doesn't really feel that. Yeah, it's really intense how like emotionally distance distant this is, especially kind of um, expressed through the camera work in contrast to Funeral Parade of Roses. It's very, very cool and cruel how cold this is. Oh boy. Oh, he is taking on some school shooter vibes. コマ。見どもが神帝惚れた女は世間広しと家でもその方だけじゃ。そういや、真に触ってたで。恋しいお方に見捨てられ。どうしておめおめ。生きておられましょう。いや。ま、現の字も地位とばかり色男役を決め込
but that's part of the enjoyment of the audience is to feel like they could uh, avoid the pitfalls that these characters avoid. There's something so uh, like dreadfully satisfying. It, what like a small aspect of what a tragedy is. There's like the cathartic aspect certainly, but there's the insane kind of satisfaction you get in feeling that these characters are so stupid. This is such a beautiful close up. And we're finally engaging in the mind of Gingobi. You see all that distance I was talking about in the early part of this film. We're finally breaking free of it. Yeah, this is what I was thinking. I was thinking whenever he like um, broke free and relented, gave in to his bloodlust, that's when we would have the turn of the camera. And this is this is also like uh, a beautiful kind of like um, Quixotean or Quixotic imagery. Him splitting the umbrellas, cutting the umbrellas, and imagining them as his as his rivals. That's like uh, such a beautiful chrysalis encapsulation of his bloodthirst, but also his impotence. <laughs> And the camera becomes so much more engaged. The like less art, the more artifices are kind of like taken down. The walls are taken down. The, the closer we get to seeing the truer version of these characters. We actually see that Koman. It's actually kind of beautiful. Uh, she's not like this like womanly lover that Gengobe. Uh, projects her as or envisions her as she's this like maternal loving woman who is, serves her husband and wants to have a family with him and while it's within the same realm it's actually actually like subtly different from the um kind of like um like the the beautiful tragic love the the tragic geisha love that um, Gengobe imagines her as. Oh, God, that image. Piercing through the veil. One more step into the inevitable. One more step into destiny. It's a lie that you could take back the things that you imagine. The, there are certain steps you take in your life that you can never take back. <gasps> oh. And this is some of that sense of smug superiority you have when you witness a tragedy. Do you think I would have hired a guard? This dream is coming true. The track, the rails of fate. Of destiny. And I love that the um, the lovers, the deceivers are playing the witness now. That this isn't something that's directly happening to them. It's a an outsized event of which they are the climax. 
Quem come? God. This is like thriller. If you've never seen thriller, a cruel picture, um, there's something so poetic in the way that it uh, expresses moments of violence. Yes, violence is the slow motion executions in both these films take on such a magical quality. From this point on, the performance will not be stopped. God, that's so beautifully shot. And the emptiness of the sound design, just the sounds of the gurgles. Oh! There's the dream. Uh, I don't know if uh, I'll have kept this part in uh, from earlier in the movie, but um, Gengobe has a vendetta, a previous vendetta for his clan that he's been unable to fulfill this entire time. And I actually really love that kind of expression of this movie that um, <sighs> these momentous acts, this act of violence isn't completed based on duty. It isn't based on um, the previous obligations that the time when Gengobe takes up arms to fulfill a task. He's actually going against code. He's going against honor. Oh, God. He's going against the law, and he's tracking down a man who's married to it. Oh, he looks like a demon in those shadows. He's going against... Um, He's tracking down and murdering a uh, married man and wife. But the only time he chooses to act out is uh, when his own ego has been bruised, when he can't view himself as a man anymore, when it's at a threat to his own self-image. So his self-image isn't crafted around honor or respect or duty. It isn't Bushido. It isn't anything. It is just slight. So is this the old path of vengeance that he was supposed to commit? Did I just stumble to that accidentally? I love that this home life is about to be destroyed. That's awful. That's just so awful. It's it's terrible that um, Saburo did all this, but he did this to repair his family, <laughs> to have a home for his wife and child, to repair things with his father. All that's going to be destroyed by the Shura, I guess. Sorry, Sangaro, not Saburo. <laughs> I'm gonna pause for a second. Pausing in three, two, one. Pause. Uh, yeah, like I, I think this is clearly this movie is suspicious, suspicious of what exactly Bushido means and what the code of honor of samurai really means. That um, that I mean, he's a ronin, but that Gengobe is a get about. He's he's lazy. He doesn't really do anything. He refuses, or better yet, uh, kind of like uh, doesn't even acknowledge his past vendetta um and spends his time loitering and sleeping with a geisha i mean we we can all understand to a certain uh to a certain point uh 
And the only time he's actually motivated is when his ego is wounded. I think that's very critical kind of like identification of the Bushido code and probably a good comparison. The, there's a, uh, a movie that was released around this time. I think it's 71 too. Big time gambling boss was similarly critical of what exactly a Yakuza kind of code of, code of honor is. No, it's 68. I'm completely wrong. Um, but it's similarly critical of what uh, Yakuza, what this code of honor amongst gangsters is, the uh, system of like fraternity of brotherhood and of um, essentially hierarchy uh, within that society. They all end up betraying each other in the, the worst possible ways. And there's no kind of allegiances of family, of brotherhood, of of decency among them and uh, i think that's something that these movies at their core are getting at that um there's this myth there's this kind of it's not even really a kurosawa in myth because it's like a projection we put onto kurosawa that may not actually align with his values but there's this myth of what the samurai is of what bushido is of what kind of like even even on the dark side even on the gangster side there's this um uh, institutional reinforcement that there's a set of values that are core to Japan that are core to its belief in hierarchy its uh, belief in rules and rigidity and structure and when you watch these movies you kind of investigate how those rules really fall apart when given enough pressure and perhaps not even so much pressure so much as so much as even like regular citizens bear that regular people bear uh, just like slights of ego slights of uh, or incentives of opportunity to like make more money than you already have when you already are some of the richest people in your society that these people um, that we hold at the height of our society uh, to represent the best values of our society are our most treacherous are our most manipulative and are the wolves that are devouring us i think it's a, a very apt and very warranted air of suspicion that can be seen in these films in the uh, late 60s and early 70s and culminating with movies like Battles of Honor, Battles Against Honor and Humanity. But like similarly to um, things that are investigated in Greek tragedies, for example, when we see uh, Clytemnestra murder Agamemnon or when you see uh, Hecuba throw her children, um, throw her grandchildren off of the tower, uh, what we're witnessing is an investigation of the core tenets that a failing empire held up as the um, reasons why they were the empire and investigating if the empire has failed, then what value was there in holding up these institutions to begin with. So this in the end is what a samurai is. This is what Bushido is. It's a murderer. Remember, he was tricked. He was wronged. Uh, nothing, nothing to justify the degree to which he has found retribution. This isn't Hecuba. Troy wasn't burned down. Paris isn't dead. Priam isn't dead. This is this was a confidence scheme. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Fufu <laughs> There's nothing to do. You're where you are. Trapped forever in this play. At the end of the day, Samurai is a murderer. Bushido is fanciful words written around the act of murder, trying to justify it. There's no nobility to his actions whatsoever. <laughs> you must remember that I'm a samurai. Bushido's 
Hero machine wearing again. And there's distance again in the camera frame because it's another performance. His performance of what a samurai is, his fantasy of what this revenge would feel like if he acts it out a certain way. Is he not even going to murder him, them with his blade? He's going to poison them? Like a woman? Like a trickster? So is there a particular reason he's refusing to kill them with his blade? Because that would go against his, like, police? So he can kill them, just not with his sword, because that would, again, intrude on his self-image as a samurai. So he's going to forego that, just end up killing them with his blade anyway? Or is he going to have to try and find a way to kill them without using it? Maybe strangle her with her own the strings of her lute. Sometimes I think too far ahead in these movies. I should just like let the story happen. And again, we sit in another performance. So much about about this movie is about performativity. In that way, it's kind of like about passivity as well. Watching horrific acts like we as an audience watch horrific acts. He's willing to destroy something beautiful. He's willing to destroy something pure. He's willing to destroy something that he loves because his ego as a man, as a samurai, is ultimately more important to him. By pure, I mean, you know what I mean. We'll get there later. tears in his eyes he's gonna murder the woman he loves is there something that's changed to him could there possibly be I know there's not, but I want to see that moment in this character. <sighs> there's something in him that could fight against this. <laughs> but he's so consumed. It's another interesting... I think, like, I think movies are essentially about transformation. And in this, I like want to like... I want to point out Gengo Bay as like another kind of like manifestation of the concept of like the ship of theseus that he keeps on replacing himself with a different goal or a different identity so much so that the previous version is unrecognizable after a certain point that there is no more love in him there's no more memories in him there's no more duty in him it's all been replaced by the avatar of vengeance and even the aspects of him that uh, can remember the parts of him that can um, go back to these memories those memories have been transformed by by bitterness by vengeance it really is water flowing out of the cup it can't go back in (laughs) 
kind of makes you feel like you should give up your your blood vendetta. Doesn't it? You feel really close to feeling that? Perhaps the memories of your time with Komon couldn't change your mind, but perhaps the honor of Hachiman's sacrifice could convince you. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh boy. It's time to move on with your life, right? You don't gotta old boy yourself, right? Your life hasn't been... You haven't become vengeance yet, right? This fucking asshole. <laughs> Big drinker. If the poison hadn't taken him, taken him out, his liver would have eventually. Whoops. Oh god. What a terrible way to die. Poison slug. In a small way, I kind of like that they're tying this back to like the, um, um, <clears throat> Like the clan, the the battles of like different clans. That uh, this on a micro level is expressing what is happening with with different clans at war with each other. Jesus Christ! Fantastic shot. What beautiful composition. The triangulation of these three. Koma. <laughs> Oh god, the entire world has gone crazy with violence. Yeah, you clean up the, that body. Whatever. The body of your brother. And I love this, like, peek into their domestic life that usually in these, like, vengeance stories, like, the uh, lived-in lives of the pursuers, the pursuants, um, is left pretty vague or... Um, is generalized like either they get away with it and they're living it happily or um or it's not really that focused on and to see so much of their lives borne out even more so than um than can go back and go back kind of takes a back seat to the second uh half of this movie we get to see so much of the fallout of what life is for uh sangoro and for koman after their plot 
and it's not even like they're necessarily living moral or immoral lives. Um, they're not paragons of virtue. They're not demons. They're they have pretty small. They have pretty small lives. They have pretty small concerns, and they've become more identifiable uh, as the film progresses than anything that we can see in Gingo Bay. Dude, your the quality of your well water is not gonna be good. <sighs> but why? But why? It's pretty convenient, read inconvenient, read coincidental that they, uh, that she managed to clean up that body so quickly. This is not about you. Gengobe. At this point, it's really not about you anymore. She just had to get that tattoo changed. That's going to piss him off so much. And I like that this is like a reflection of their earlier lovemaking scene. That's terrible. It's terrible. Do not cut off her arm. Is he referring to himself in the third person? That'd be a cool aspect of uh, this characterization. That he's become completely divorced from his personhood. That he's just become this warrior, or he's just become this killer. <gasps> oh, Jesus. Oh, and the camera just goes insane. It was so easy for him. It wasn't even a culmination of anything. It's just this flash. This flash of violence. This was supposed to be so important to him. Oh. Yeah, this is pretty terrible. I mean, he's already turned his back on every single belief he's had. He said he wouldn't harm women or children. He's already taken a blade to a woman, so I, I, I doubt he's going to change his ways at this point. The shadow. Oh my god, the blade. <gasps> it's terrible. Terrible incel movie, terrible school shooter movie. Just terrible, terrible the impulses in this movie. 
the transformation made by um by uh, Katsuo Nakamura is astounding, though. I mean, the, the complete opposite of the restraint he showed as uh, Hoichi. This is like an incredible unraveling. Just his breathing patterns. He can't even breathe like a human being anymore. He is this wasting demon. Oh, that makes sense. The father is the monk at the beginning of this movie. He's going to kill his father, too. He's going to kill Sangro, and he's going to kill Sangro's father. He's going to kill a priest at the end of this movie. That's interesting. The evil that consumes the world. I love the camera slowly, slowly pushing in on him. That's tremendous. Hunter Rio was a very small decision in your life. <laughs> There's so many bigger decisions you've made since then. I'm gonna pause for a second. Pausing in three, two, one, pause. I love that idea of motivation. That um, because it because it like ties into his self concept, his conceptualization, um, as like a lover. I think that's essentially, in some ways, how um, Kengobe views himself as a jilted lover. What he's done is not like a reflection of love in any way whatsoever. <laughs> it's fascinating to see like the axis on which his character has turned, seemingly having nothing to do with how he conceives of himself. Um, the idea that he thought that he was willing to sacrifice everything for <laughs> uh, Koman, and he was barely even able to give up the hunter um, Rio to to free her to. Um, to ransom her, uh, it had he had to be convinced by Sangaro, and he he's like displayed no decisiveness and no ability to take action until it um, he made the decision to murder all the people that had tricked him. The thing that was like hardest for him to part with wasn't his honor, it wasn't his love, it was. The idea that he was composed of those things, his his ego, his um, selfish image of himself, and when that image was attacked, he responded swiftly and brutally. It's terrible. Okay, starting again. Starting three, two, one, start. <laughs> it's terrible. Terrible. This is all he views Koman as, as a figurehead. It would, it would have been impossible for him to love her alive. This was always what he imagined their relationship being. He always imagined starving himself for her. He always imagined dying for her. There was never a version of this love that wasn't completely deadly he knows he's a fool it's terrible I couldn't stop myself they've been serving him this entire time that's terrible they've been serving him this entire time in order to restore his place in order to restore his name and he's destroyed it all guess what you caused all of this 
源兵衛様がそうでもさとそちゃさんの Circle has com- come back around on itself. This is like a samurai version of a time travel movie. The circle is complete. This paradox of vengeance, of violence, the violence created itself. They've been serving at his behest this entire time to, to restore his name, to restore him to prominence. It's all been pointless. He paid a hundred Rio to have himself to, so that he could be paid. It's really, really fucking pointless. It's really fucking awful. s a n g r o has been serving for him this entire time. He did all of this for him. There are, are no coffins. There are no burials. There is no ceremony. All these bodies will be splayed out in the open for everyone to witness. The veil will be pierced over and over and over again. Gengobe's fingers will always go through the window. The, uh, the coffin will always be broken through. Jesus. <laughs> you know, whatever makes you happy. And again, we have this instance where it's not just a drama that's playing out between、um, the principal participants, that there's always a,、um, an outsider or somebody who's like ancillarily related, who is like acts as a witness. That's bleak. That's bleak. That's bleak. God. And this ongoing war, this ongoing feud, it just keeps on going endlessly. It will never, never end. The participants may change, but the cycle will never, ever end. Like, yeah, it's, it's grim. It's an entirely closed loop. Of, of, of violence, of revenge.、Uh, every participant is completely culpable in this. Like, you could blame everybody for、uh, what transpires in this. I, I know it, at the crux of it is,、um, is Geng,、uh, Gengobe, but like,、uh, <laughs> it's, it's tragedy. It's, Inescapable. Nobody could have prevented this from happening.、Uh, everybody's equally responsible for it in some way. Like、um, Gengobe wanting to、uh, restore his honor ends up destroying his honor. He ends up destroying everything.、Um, 
Songuro wanting to um, pay his father ends up getting his family killed. Um, his father wanting to restore the honor of his benefactor or his um, his master ends up serving to have his son and uh, daughter-in-law and grandson murdered, even uh, Hachioman. Um, it's really weird. Uh, Hachioman, by getting those 100 Ryo, uh, condemns them all to die. And like I just played this back earlier, just went back a little bit earlier, even Hachiman forcing Koman out early, forcing her out without her without her purse is what brings her back and makes her see the 100 Ryo. Like there were a hundred points where you as like an audience member could watch this and think if this had changed, none of this would have happened. All of this seems preventable, but all of it is inevitable. <laughs> And I like the kind of like widening scope of this, the macrocosmic um, implications of this, that uh, Gengobe as um, as Kuemon, as uh, as a samurai, was supposed to return to um, to Otoshi and serve with forty other men to uh, pay out this blood vendetta, and they would have all died too. That this was all pointless in um in any iteration even if he hadn't gone on his own personal vengeance he would have been a part of 40 men who would have um acted out enacted in vendetta and then killed themselves at the end as a as a ritual as a sacrifice it, it was all fucking pointless it's just dead men and women all of them trying desperately to escape death and all of them willingly electing to die early it's a fucking blood it's a it's a death cult this this culture is a death death cult it's an insane movie yeah i think a lot like funeral parade of roses <sighs> demons is a lot it's a full-blown jesus christ how could they do that tragedy tragedy like funeral parade of roses is a tragedy tragedy like um oedipus rex or um or medea or agamemnon is a tragedy or the libation bearers is a tragedy and like the greek tragedies like the Japanese tragedies, like the tragedies that occur in America on a daily basis, you could see it coming from a mile away. You know exactly what's going to happen, and every single time you are horrified to witness it happening again. <laughs> um, yeah, this is this movie is horrifying i'll just say that let me know what you think fuck man give it a watch let me know what you think in the meantime don't forget to click the like button and subscribe for more old obscure and art house films and until next time keep watching good movies <laughs>